Sorry. You good? <laughs> so we're going to go ahead and get started. Thanks, y'all, for coming. Um, the homecoming parade and all, it's a busy time of year for everyone. Uh, before I introduce Greg, I wanted to tell you that tomorrow at 3, we're going to have Marcy Spencer here. She's going to talk about the history of San Angelo National Forest, so please join us if you can. But tonight, we're happy to have Greg Clark here. He's going to talk a bit about his, his new book, uh, Ghost Country, The Lost Hauntings of Southern Appalachia. So please welcome Greg to see you later. Thank you. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, before I can say anything about the book, I, I have to tell you about where any of this came from to, to even start to write a book like this. My wife and I were teachers third grade, eighth grade English and history, and um, she is rooted in Jackson County, just way, 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 way back. I'm rooted, like I was just telling you all, um, we know at least 1818, the land auction from Waynesville, um, Joseph Welch, uh, there was, um, he's the man where the Sali was assassinated on his front lawn, he's the only white witness in the records to the assassination of Sali. Um, also, when in 1818, when Gideon Morris, a mediator between some of the Indians who were trying to fight to save their land, took it to the North Carolina Supreme Court, it was my, uh, it was against, it was an, an Indian against my, my grandfather, and the Indian won. However, my grandfather burned out his home and took the land anyway, which was, uh, you know, sadly what happened. You know, that's, uh, that's what happened. But rooted way back all the way back, 10 generations at least right here in the region. When I was a little boy, I just stayed in a library collecting any kind of ghost story book, Indian legends, lore, um, anything about the mountains, but anything about any state that I could get my hands on that was ghost related, fascinated by it. And my wife convinced me years ago to be a teacher. I was gonna be a songwriter. I was gonna be the next Chris Christopherson. I wanted to, I, I realized that wasn't gonna happen, so she, she put my feet on the ground and, and we teach. And she's at year 15, I'm at year 13. Six years ago, we were in Swain County and we had taken the kids tubing down Deep Creek, what parents do, and there's a little storytelling thing over there. And she handed me a flyer she picked up on Everett Street. And she said, she said, you should do something like this in Franklin. Well, I knew there was rich history in Franklin, but I didn't know how rich. I, I had never learned it in growing up, you know, just didn't know. And I immediately was sparked by the idea that she, she planted that seed. And I started researching. Mm -hmm. I started going to the, to the historical museum on Franklin's Main Street. Started going to, um, prime, to elderly people's homes and sitting with them. And after about six months, I realized that I couldn't put what I'd already learned in a three-hour tour. There's, it was far too much. But we were going to try to do a ghost tour, a historic ghost tour in Macon County. I thought we'd have one weekend. It would be a joke. You know, my wife would show up, our kids would come, you know, somebody <laughs> throw tomatoes. But that was six years ago. And from that, we've walked thousands of people, all right? We've walked thousands of people. We now have the Franklin Historic Ghost Tour running, running tonight. We have the Haunted Homes of Franklin Tour running. We have the Woodlawn Cemetery Tour in Franklin. We have the Historic Silva Ghost Tour, which is fantastic. The history that we've dug up here is fantastic. All right, things on the horizon. Waynesville, North Carolina comes in the spring, the Green Hill Cemetery, where you will be able to stand at the trumpeteer of Robert E. Lee. You'll get to go and stand beside the Secret Service agent who drove Kennedy that fateful day in Dallas in 63. He's buried right over there. And so many more. Looking at Murphy as well. And we're looking at Folly Beach, South Carolina. We're going down, um, spending our Thanksgiving break in Folly Beach, South Carolina to set up Where Shadows Walk, Historic Ghost Tours of Folly, which will tackle um, the other part of the Carolinas, shipwrecks and Blackbeard and Union soldiers and headless things walking the beach and so on and so forth. So the tours have been successful, um, grandly so, um, to the point where like, how in the world ha ha has this worked so well? So then as we would do the tours, as my lovely wife would say, people would say, well, is there a book? Is there a book? Oh, 
book's a lot of work, right? You know, you know. I'm an English teacher, history teacher. I don't call myself a, a historian. So I decided, all right, all right, well, I'm gonna throw myself into this. And it was very, very difficult. Not, not the writing. I love to write, but to do 31 short stories is like doing 31 little novels. All right. Um, the book that I'm writing now, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's stay with that. We're doing 31 short stories, it's right, like 31 little novels. At least I attempted to make it so. Here's where I, I try to be a perfectionist. Um, I collected ghost story books always, still do. Got a huge library of ghost story books. Um, most of which are about a page and a half long, two pages, three, four pages tops. Um, I would. That was what I knew of a ghost story, you know, that length, kind of a, a nugget of a, you know, here's a little history, here's the scary part, and you know, now today people still say that along this road they, so and so. That was all good and fine, I love that stuff. But then years ago I started reading um, short story writers like Ron Rash, local Ron Rash, different people like that, and really looking at the rich imagery and the, the simile and the onomatopoeia and the metaphor and the, the, the everything that you know a writer like Rash brings to a, a short story, and so what I thought, I thought, what if I take that classic page and a half to four page ghost story, and I build it into a, a Ron Rash esque story, and that's what Ghost Country Volume One is, and I worked so hard. The hardest part was the research. All right. I wanted to not tell twice told tales. I didn't want to give anyone the Pink Lady of the Grove Park. I didn't want to give anyone um, Sale. I didn't want to give anyone basic things that people could find, have heard before. I wanted the lost hauntings of Southern Appalachia. So what I did was a mixture of sitting in, in Homes with 97-year-old men and women living in front of books and, and computer screens. Microfish, microfilm, we did that for, for murder. Um, anything, um, finding old books that were being cast out of museums. I found one of the greatest nuggets ever in a 1928 book called The Lure of the Great Smoky Mountains was being tossed out of a museum. Some of the best, best stuff that I could get, all right? I then take the rich, real history and I take the ghost story and I weave it together as if it were a tapestry, as if I were making a quilt. I'll give you an example. Before I read something, I'll give you an example. A little old lady calls me. She calls me and she says, I want to, I got a ghost story for you. I said, all right, yeah, that's what I want. That's what I want. She says, you'll have to come and get me. I'm not driving and I'll take you where this happened. So we scheduled a time. I went and met her. I got her in the car. And she took me to a community called Burning Town over in Macon County, all right? I helped her get out of the car, and she walked through the tall grass, and she finally found this little meandering waterfall that goes up. She says, right here, here's right here where it happened. This is where it happened to Daddy. And I remember when he came home that morning and how pale he was and how he cried and so on and so forth. And then she told me the whole ghost story, all right? Good. That's good for me. Fantastic. Because I couldn't, I wasn't there with her father. I would have never gotten that. And what I love is nobody had that. Nobody had that story. That's not in any book you can find anywhere. So I take that home, that story home. I've got that. And I know that it happens, we'll say, 1942. All right? Now, what I do at that point is I go to the newspapers. I dig down into 42. And I dig down, we'll say, dig down into 42 a newspaper. All right? But you know how in newspapers today you can say so-and-so happened 20 years ago? You know, if you open up a, a Silver Herald, 20 years ago today, this happened. Well, in newspapers from the 1920s, they did the same thing, I found out. And it would say, 20 years ago today, so you're dealing with 1870s, 1880s at this point, and I'm getting these nuggets of people, right? I'm not necessarily looking for gallows and hangings and blood, but I'm looking for regular people. And so I find old Uncle Ike, all right? I find that there's an old African American who was the he was the gas lamp lighter of Franklin's main streets, late 1800s. That was his job. He took pride in it. 
But then everything went to electricity in the 1930s and he became a shiftless town drunk with shoelaces untied and lost in the shadows of the alleys, all right? And so I take these characters that are real that I find and I build a story. I build something that to me would be movie worthy. I want to, to make something rich, okay? So I take the true story, I take the deep history, and I paint it and I color it on many of them, some of which I didn't have to, some of which the primary sources made for a story from 1972, right? I didn't have to do anything like that. It was rich enough on its own or something that um, a historical final surrender of the American Civil War, you know, on our Main Street, you know, didn't have to do as much right there. All right, so that's the manner in which I do this. All right, now let me talk about um, a, couple, a couple of the tours themselves, just a little bit. Franklin's Historic Ghost Tour. We have the final surrender of the American Civil War on our Main Street, and you're thinking, oh, Appomattox. We surrendered in April. But the very final surrender, the last surrender, was when Captain Stephen Whitaker surrendered his forces on Franklin's Main Street. We've got a big, beautiful marker over there that locals have never even seen on their Main Street. The one by, oh, really? Right? Silva, North Carolina. Silva, North Carolina. All right? We've got one of the great, one of the best documented granny witches in American history right here. We've got the Witch of Caney Four, Granny Rebecca Hawks at Galloway Aiken, man. That's one of our stories right in here. But we've got Silva, you just, if you haven't walked the Silva tour, we've got the first female to ever record music in America, right here. She was Mrs. Samantha Baumgarten, although the stories about her, we've got, like I said, the, the Witch of Candy Fork. We've got fantastic stories here, more than you can fit into. We try to squeeze it into a two hour tour. This is actually our Silva tour guide right here, this is Sarah. We try to <laughs> squeeze it into a two hour tour, but it's almost impossible. There's so much, all right? So that's who I am, that's who we are, that's the, the tours, Where Shadows Walk, Historic Ghost Tours, and the book came out as a labor of love, as a, an accompaniment for the tours, and once I finished these 31 short stories, I realized that volume 2, volume 3, and volume 4 were easily, easily th this big, I'm going to have this many for all, the, there's far too many stories that keep coming. Now the next book though, we're gonna skip. We're not gonna go right to volume two because the next book is almost written and it's called Three Days in 63 and it's gonna be about the Francis Bullock murder. It's one of the oldest cold cases in North Carolina. Francis Bullock was butchered. She was stabbed so brutally in 1963, July 26, 1963. And whenever served a day of time for it, it's always been a, a covered up taboo murder and it's, it's a fantastic story. I can't wait for everybody to read that story. And her ghost story is the last story in this book as a, well. A ghost story, as a, as a bit of a teaser, the, the last story in this book is a ghost story from the Francis Bullock book that we're coming out with. All right? I will read to you. I want to mention the cover photographs. Cover photographs. And, and the photographs Absolutely. In the book. All right. Anybody seen the show The Walking Dead? Right, I've watched one and a half episodes myself, so don't worry about it. <laughs> I, I, I love Gene, he's a family friend, but his, his work, mm, it's not my, my, not my cup of tea, but he's a great photographer, all right? Gene Page um, came up, he's the only still shot photographer for the show The Walking Dead, and he came up and he did our cover for us, and he's gonna do the next two covers, and he also um, gave us fantastic images for the book, beautiful images that he that he um, took in an old abandoned mansion. So we have these wonderful photographs that he allowed us to use through the book. That had never been published. Never been published, never been, no one's ever seen them before. And so um, prior to publishing Ghost Country, not only did we have all these stories, but we have you know, this art, so it's kind of this package of art that we were so proud of, all right? The first story, or it might be the only story, but the story that I'm gonna to read to you is a story that happened right here on our main street of Silva. Okay? It sounds like they're having fun out there. <laughs> yeah, right. And the church that's on the front cover is in Macon County as well. It's it's an old African American church that has a cemetery there. So that church is in Macon County. All right. 
Now, this is called Like an Old Black Snake. Three doctors stood in the dark woods just outside of the tiny village of Webster, North Carolina on a hot July night in 1873. They were just barely able to see the grave from where they stood. The hanging had been just as hideous and glorious as expected. Hundreds of people had turned out. Speeches had been made. Some prayed. But most with wide eyes gnawed on cold chicken, hoping to get close enough to hear his neck crack. Bayless Henderson had been hanged for the cold-blooded murder of Nimrod Jarrett, and rightly so. But the dirty work was far from over. The witches would be about soon. Ann Cameron might try. The mile-high witch may be watching them as they stood and waited. Beck Akins from Moses Creek might attempt. There could be any number of witches waiting on the last stragglers to go home, waiting for enough moonlight to paint their pursuits. And this could not be. They could not get his head. When the last voices of lawmen and grave diggers bled into the night, the three doctors plunged from the pitch black forest with shovels and saws. By the time the moon hung high, all three men, white shirts turned brown and transparent by sweat, were carrying the dead man away. One took his legs, another took his torso, while the last ran away with his arms, shoulders, and head. With the grave empty, the night birds piercing the stillness and not a trace of wind, the doctors ensured no more evil would rise up from the bloodthirsty killer at a witch's hand. Lucius whipped the reins with a quick jerk of his, thi of his thick wrists, and in his stony rough voice called out, Giddy up! The two old mules, who had offered up seemingly two good lifetimes, quickened their gait and snorting plunged headlong into the dark night. Lucius and his tiny wife Mel were both nearing their 80th birthdays, and their day that was nearing its end had been a good day. They'd been to a hanging. Life on Moses Creek in Jackson County, North Carolina, for the two had been heaven and hell. There had been times when the mountains were bountiful, the can house was filled, the smokehouse too. There had been times for the both of them they'd shut out, dark times. Times like when Lucius had to peel, almost breaking them in the process, Mel's fingers from the hilt of a kitchen knife so as to prevent her from taking her own life on the day she buried her fourth child. Times like when Lucius had to be raised up from a drunken fetal position by male neighbors after his barn had burned to the ground in the dead of winter. However, they'd shut them out. They'd been to a hanging, and there was plenty to talk about. As the lantern, tethered to the side of the wagon, swung to and fro with the inequalities of the hard-worn road, Lucius replayed the crime out loud. He had run it through probably a hundred times in the last two months, and given the late hour, the death of the killer, and the silent acquiescence of his partner, he slowly and methodically like he was checking items off of a list, replayed the crime again. Nimrod Jarrett, <coughs> Lucius spoke, in a voice neither weak nor thin, was a wealthy landowner in Macon County. He'd held an officer's rank from the Indian Wars, served in the Home Guard during the Civil War under Captain Whitaker some years before. As Mel's husband gingerly laid the table with the facts and the findings, she sprinkled the salt and spread the butter. She poured the milk and let a spoon sink slow into a jar of golden honey. She feasted on the scenes, drank in the morning he was serving up. She put herself in every scene, and as mute as a ghost, unnoticed, became part of Lucius's late night tale. He was an old man, Lucius continued. He was known throughout the region to carry on his person large sums of money. On one of his many day trips down the mountain for business, Jarrett came upon the newly arrived handyman, Bayless Henderson, walking the trail. The old man kindly offered the young man a ride across the river on his very own horse. The handyman, who told everyone he'd recently come from West Tennessee, dismounted on the other side of the river, thanked the old man for his hospitality, and pulled a pistol from his sagging pants pocket and blew a wide black hole into the back of the old man's head. Hearing the report of the pistol, Mrs. Jarrett, who was riding further behind on her own horse, quickened her pace. 
Unable to dismount due to physical disability, the dead man's wife rode hard to a neighbor's cabin. Within an hour, there were several able-bodied men standing about the body. However, no one touched it. The men were bear hunters. They understood sign. They carefully investigated the scene. They found footprints in the mud near the body of the dead man. Having been frightened away by the calls of Mrs. Jarrett approaching, Henderson had barely had time to check the old man's pockets. He did sweep the contents, though. A pocket watch, a few trinkets, but only a small amount of money. He ran across the river, hid the meager loot in a rotting log, and then joined the crowd of gawking onlookers gathered about the corpse. It took no time at all for the mountain hunters to compare the boot tracks in the mud to those of Bayless Henderson. Notice his wet pants and sense a feigned compassion for the old dead man. Soon Henderson was locked away in the Macon County Jail. While being interrogated by local law, Bayless revealed information that did nothing in the way of redeeming his character. He'd been one of Kirk's raiders. Colonel George Washington Kirk and his bloody raiders were the worst of the worst Union pirates of the American Civil War. Their jobs were simple. Confiscate anything of value in the Southland that might further the cause of Lincoln's army by any means necessary. He told the authorities he'd liked the mountains and after the war was over, he decided to come back. Deep in the night, Henderson escaped the Macon County Jail, leading authorities and posses on a hell of a ride through the Great Smoky Mountains. The escaped prisoner was recaptured. He'd been found in a laurel thicket just over the Tennessee line and was soon back behind bars. Henderson admitted killing old Mr. Jerry. He even took police back to the murder scene in order to garner the trifles he'd stolen from Jared's pockets. Though the great lawyer Cope Elias acted as his defense attorney, Henderson was doomed. He was sentenced to hang. He was hanged in the village of Webster, North Carolina in front of hundreds of eager eyes on the 5th day of July, 1872. I swear, he was looking right at me, Mel. Coldest eyes I've ever looked into, that's a fact. Lucius said this with looking, without looking at his wife. And as was her custom, she never replied. Words were used sparingly between the two old mountaineers. When Mel spoke, Lucius knew to listen. The ancient wagon tilted and tossed about on the rutted old road that snaked its way up the mountain to their humble cabin, a cabin that would be cold and still as the tomb when they arrived. Lucius, feeling a bit macabre from the tone the events of the day had set, Continued, yes, sir. He was looking right at me. I've seen the evil eye before out of Beck Aikens and Ann Cameron, Vice Borden. With this, Mel, who'd been still as a dead calf, silently gorging herself on her husband's recollections of facts and motives, jerked her head like a striking copperhead snake. Lucius Mills, you hush that wicked tongue of yourn. These hills is not shed of them old witches yet. Like his not ain't going to be. You mind your tongue, old man. Rebecca Beck Hoxett Aiken and Cameron and Vice Borden were the most infamous witches in the old Smoky Mountains, and Mel knew better than to even mention their names. There were too many tales abounding to discount their sorcery, too many dead cows, dead crops, and dead babies. I swear I'll go to ground in Jesus, wondering if you have any mind at all, Lucius Mills she said through gritted teeth. When Mel finished speaking, she pulled her shawl tighter about her bony shoulders, and Lucius could tell she was looking a bit deeper into the darkness than she had been before. For a while they both rode in silence, but a seed had been planted, and after a spell, Mel began to speak. I'm calling her Old Slipper. I'll not use her name, Lucius startled at Mel's having decided to open a conversation at all, and doubly so on account of her choice of topic, turned his eyes in the dark night toward his little lady holding tight to the corners of her shawl. Mel had told him years before that her brother James had always called Beck Aikens Old Slipper because no one ever heard her coming. The night closed in around the two, and the jarring, rattling wagon seemed to grow quieter as Mel spoke. It was a Sunday. Grandma had just died. 
me and mommy and Sal hurried around the house stopping the clocks and draping the mirrors. We'd know she was dying for a time. She'd seen them corpse candles uh, dancing around the foot of her bed. Screech Owl had lit on the porch for four nights running, calling something awful. Well, we'd no sooner darned her burying dress and washed it when old Slipper come up on the porch. She knocked on the door with the head of that stick of hern. Mommy took to crying and carrying on. Sal, a lot like you, ain't got the sense God give to dishwater swung that door open and told old Slip to go back to hell and leave us to mourn. Well, we'd laid Grandma out on the table to wash her. She didn't have a stitch on. It just seemed like time stood still. <laughs> Mommy ran around the corner crying. Sal and me just stood with our fly traps agaping. And if God's in heaven, that old witch broke a smile and Grandma sat up on that table. She started a jerking and a flog in the air. Mama run back into the room and it took all three of us to lay Grandma back out. Old Slip turned to go. Never offered a thing, but she said as she is leaving over her shoulder, she said, they'll do that now. Like an old black snake, they'll quiet. <laughs> Lucius knew better than to dig any further. The well his wife had just uncovered was colder and deeper than any he'd known. And she'd never once told him that story. They rode on in silence. The lantern threw light into and out of the woods. The woods so close, a reached hand from either side of them might have tickled the limb tips, and the air grew uncomfortably cold. Both Lucius and Mel were nearly dozing when their two mules jumped and snorted, then a heavy thumping sound, as if someone had tossed a bag of cornmeal into the back of their wagon made the old couple crane their necks to their great surprise, in the dead of the night, miles from any neighbor, a man had jumped into the back of their wagon. He was sitting on the tail end with his feet dangling. It was too dark to tell who the man was at first, but this was highly unsettling to the old couple. They turned and looked at each other without a word at first, then Lucius called out, Hello! Who's back there? There was no response. I says, Hello! The old man tried again to gain the attention of their nocturnal stowaway. This time, though, he yelled as loud as he could. Mel grabbed hold of her husband's arm and squeezed. From where she sat, she could see something hanging down the speechless man's back. It was a noose. The old couple, scared the mules, would throw them from the wagon, were astounded when their two old helpers actually slowed their pace, lowered their heads, and hypnotically ambled on. Both Lucius and Mel were too frightened to speak, and the man, still wearing his rope, offered no banter either. Finally, after what seemed an eternity, Lucius again called out, Bayless, is it you? The man, legs swinging, finally spoke. It's me, Grandpa. It's going to ride up to the ridge. Almost immediately, the man turned his face toward the two horror-stuck travelers. It was Bayless Henderson. Mel could see that his face was purple. One of his eyes had blown out like a busted, hard-boiled egg. He nodded, then jumped from the wagon, disappearing into the night. The old couple didn't go to bed that night. They sat by the fire, recalling the day. They both had their ideas. Lucius believed the dying man might have been looking at him because he looked like his own grandfather. And maybe, Lucius went on, he followed him caught up with him on the steep mountain trail and thought he was just going home. Mel had another theory altogether. She hadn't given it a moment's thought when it happened. But looking back, she recalled how Bayless's body had shook a bit when it was brought down from the gallows. And she remembered seeing Beck Aikens at the hanging. Though the witch had bled into the mob of onlookers and Mel had lost sight of her completely, she distinctly remembered hearing someone in the crowd repeat that damn line from a lifetime ago. They'll do that now. <laughs> like an old black snake, they'll quarrel. Though Bayla Sanderson was represented by one of the finest lawyers in the American South at the time, Cope Elias, he was hanged for his bloody crime. His body was taken down from the gallows and buried in a nearby clearing. Just after the sun set, before Beck Aikens or any other witch could get at his skull, which was a very real fear, which is often disinterred murderers in order to garner their skulls 
And the idea was to saw the top of the skull off, use it for a bowl, and cast the most demonic spells from it. Before this could happen, three Smoky Mountain doctors exhumed Bayless's body, sawed with their amputation kits his freshly buried corpse into three distinct parts, and carried him away into the dark and foreboding southern Appalachian night. All right. <laughs> This story, this single story, how it intertwines with our tours. If you do our Woodlawn tour, you stand at the grave of Nimrod Jarrett. If you do our Silva tour, from the bottom of the courthouse stairs, Sarah will tell you about how their wagon, Lucius and Mel's wagon, would have gone right through the dirt road right there and then on up. All right, because they would have seen the Webster hanging. All right, so she tells that story there. We intertwine all the real history, all the real graves, all the real occurrences. And something special about this story, something really special about this story, is I first heard this from my wife's family. Before I ever knew the history, when I met my wife 17 years ago, her mother and father told me, they would tell me ghost stories of the region. I was always ready to soak in a ghost story. And so they told me about their great grandparent great-grandparents Lucius and Mel who were the real characters who used to always tell the story and they passed down to their grandparents and to them tell the story of seeing the ghost of Bayless Henderson after they had attended his hanging in Webster and so once again I got the real ghost story from that had been passed down three generations in this in this instance I had the graves in one county story in another research also the great cope Elias. he's buried in another grave in woodlawn cemetery and so put it all together all the truth the truth the ghost story the true story the real hanging the real graves who cope Elias was macon county jail is still there where bayless henderson was kept it's an 1850 jail you put it all together and people can walk to these places and look at these buildings and then they can take this home with them all right so Ideally, it started off as a companion, you know, and we do that with story after story after story. I don't intend to continue it as a companion book so much. It kind of worked out perfectly like that. The next book, volume two, I already have all the stories ready and prepared. It too, you know, is going to be very similar to where you'll get to a stand at a place and you can purchase the story as well. But I don't limit the book to that. Do we want to hear another story, or do we want Q&A, or what do we want to do? I'll be happy to give another story. What do we want to do? Another story. Okay. Would you, be, would you like to keep it Jackson County, since we're here in Jackson County? Would you like a story just on the Witch of Candy Fork now? Yeah. All right. She was my relative. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what he's gotten into. <laughs> now, the beautiful thing about this, we, and I'm glad that Sarah got to be a part of this as well, nobody, nobody has gotten to go to the original home place of Granny Beck Aikens but us. We had to, we found a guide, right, who lives so far up in the, the mountains, very reclusive with his long feather earrings, <laughs> really an eclectic individual. And we got to hike down to the hearthstone and to the little wall that's deep in the mountains, um, so far off the beaten path. I didn't think a vehicle could possibly get up the, the road that we got up into. And so we got to go to the original um, home site of Granny Beck. And then she is supposedly buried at the um, Balsam Grove. Um, the tiny little stone. But it was just a few years ago that someone put a little marker on it that says Granny Beck, the Witch of Candy Fork. And so a lot of people suspect that she's not really buried there, you know. Who knows? All right? This is the Witch of Candy Fork. And she, again? And again, he got the, this, um, some of the stories from my mom, her family. Mm -hmm. um, the beginnings. Of the things that had happened from her grandparents, um, things that had happened. And then, then going from those seeds, from going from that, genealogically, we started going online and finding the most fantastic 
other people are writing their family trees and their histories, and they're talking about their great grandmother's tales of Granny Beck Aiken. And so we get, she was she's the most documented mountain witch of the region, and that she's right she was right here in this area. Now right right here. From the tall crags and lush hollows to the massive waterfalls that rush along the stony cliffs thick with balsam pine, from hidden streams to hidden caves, the southern Appalachian mountains lick the air with such life and intensity that one can easily imagine the wood fairies whirling and spinning about through the mist. The southern Appalachian mountains have for centuries cradled babies of a multitude of species, hardened men's hands and wills with their rugged and unforgiving seasons. Many a good man and woman have scratched out a living along the hills and valleys of southern Appalachia where the wails of old church hymns can still be heard bouncing off of cliffs from lips that have long been entombed. And where laughter still rings out from boarded up schoolhouses and sweet music tickles your senses as it sails on the wind from barns and corn cribs long ago abandoned. For 200 years, in contrast to the aforementioned beauty and majesty of the mountains, Tales of witches have made their way down the sylvan slopes, into the stores, churches, into the homes of mountain folk. Consequently, generation upon generation of mountain children have tucked little Bibles beneath their pillows, prayed for angel care, and sweated themselves to sleep as they built Granny Beck in their little minds, pipe smoke and all. Thin trails of gray smoke like corn snakes wriggled from Granny Rebecca Hoxit Aiken's chimney. Candles set blowing on her windowsills. Her old house sat in a clearing that ran alongside a laughing little brook. Granny Beck's little wooden shack just barely stood, supported by large pale stones that elevated the front end of the house, and around the house a low wall of river rock dotted with large flint, moss clinging to many. In the spring, daffodils grew all around her house, and the children from the Moses Creek and Caney Fork communities would sneak into Granny Beck's yard and steal handfuls of the golden flowers, always on a dare, and never when she was home. Even though Granny Beck was never at home when the children did this, the audacious youngsters who stole from Granny Beck's yard always grew ill directly after. <laughs> One young man took pneumonia only two weeks after grabbing a dozen or so flowers from her yard and died. Granny Beck made no sound when she walked. She was constantly on the move. Her eyes, a pale blue like campfire smoke, her hair always pulled into a tight bun, white as new cotton. Her face sagged with age like no one had ever seen, and her mouth was hard with no lips. Granny Beck smoked a pipe that smelled like roasting ham and apples. No one knew how old she was, and she wasn't registered in the old church Bibles. Some old-timers claim that when they were children, she was just as old back then. <laughs> Granny Beck carried with her a crooked stick that she used to support her old, thin frame as she scaled the mountains on her daily visits to the families who so despised seeing her coming. And around her neck, tied shut with a piece of worn leather, the old witch carried a conjure bag. The bag made of burlap swung from side to side as she walked. Granny Beck was always whispering to herself and making gestures of recognition to people and things no one else could ever see. Ruthie Mills lived high atop a mountain on Moses Creek with her mother Mary, her father Eustace, three brothers and one baby sister. And on many occasions while playing in the remote forest around her home on the mountain, Ruthie was surprised by Granny Beck. Ruthie was never heard Granny Beck approaching, nor did anyone else. And often Ruthie wasn't even on the trail when Granny Beck surprised her. Granny Beck would always whistle. And when Ruthie spun around, startled, Granny Beck would say in a voice that resembled a screech owl, You better get on home now, Ruthie. Just pass the devil on his way up here to get you. <laughs> Ruthie was terrified of Granny Beck. The withered old hag had been known to have been in several places at once. Sometimes she would disappear into thin air. Once on a fine day in the fall, Granny Beck appeared at the edge of the woods while Ruthie and her brothers and sister were climbing into the back of their father's old wagon. Granny Beck called out with a wicked grin, Eustace, can you carry me to the store? No room, Beck. Ruthie's father bellowed back and then quickly hurried the mules along. Ruthie watched as Granny Beck turned and slowly began to hobble back down the mountain trail she had climbed with great effort. 
Eustace had known Granny Beck to hitch rides into town before with other families. The minute she got into their wagons, their mules would become panic-stricken and act out wildly. Also, Ruthie's father knew that some 20 years prior, Granny Beck had been offered a ride to a county picnic 13 miles away. Granny Beck had denied the ride, but when the family arrived at the picnic ground, the old witch was already there. Some say she took the form of a sparrow and flew there. Others say crow. When Ruthie jumped out of the wagon in town, her father harshly told her and her siblings not to wander far because he was just getting a sack of flour. It wouldn't take <coughs> long, he said. Ruthie walked with her father into the tiny shack they called the town store. She eyed the pink and blue gumballs, black licorice, orange slices, sprinkled in sugar, chocolate-covered peanuts, but knew better than to touch, never to ask. Ruthie was oblivious to the goings-on in the store as she wandered around a large stack of blankets and gently ran her short fingers along the side of an axe handle. Suddenly, her father called her name sharply. Ruthie! Go over here, girl! Ruthie ran to her father's side. She found him staring like a scared rabbit into a darkened corner of the store. For there, sitting by the crackling fire, in an old weathered chair with a sharp little smirk on her pale and deeply wrinkled face, smoking her black pipe was Granny Beck. Granny Beck took a deep drag from her pipe, with wreaths of stony smoke boiling from her slit of a mouth, and around her head she croaked, When a fire cracks and pops, Ruthie, that's that old devil snapping his fingers at you. Eustace cursed Granny Beck for being a witch, while the wiry little storekeeper shuffled into the back room so as to avoid any curses being laid unnecessarily upon him. <laughs> On the long and bumpy ride back up the mountain, Eustace crowed loudly about Granny Beck's sorcery. The children, for once, were silent, so as to soak up every last heart-throbbing detail. As Mary listened, offering a head nod in agreement with something Eustace said from time to time, or a faint, that's right, every so often. Eustace filled the dusky drive time with stories of Granny Beck. He told of a Galloway man she'd once been married to who'd mysteriously disappeared. He told of how she'd been arrested 22 years before, charged with fornication and adultery at an advanced age. But it was the stories he'd heard as a child about the old witch and what he himself had actually witnessed her do that enchanted Ruthie and the other children the most. And as he spoke, the wagon that rattled along the steep mountain trail melted away. It was no longer 1910, but 1880. Ruthie could see it all. She walked as silent witness beside the little boy that still lived somewhere in her daddy. She crawled along beside him as he and his sisters, her adult aunts now, hid a broomstick beneath the porch of their old cabin. She heard the girl squeal with excitement. She's coming! Then with them, she hid in the laurel at the yard's edge as Granny Beck peeled back the limbs of some low-hanging pines and entered their dirty, rocky swath of a yard. Ruthie held her breath with the others as the old witch began to scale the porch steps, and just like them, she gasped when Granny Beck stopped, lingered on the third step, then cut her cold eyes to where they were hiding in the laurel and said, Hide in a broomstick, did you? <laughs> Everyone knew a witch could never step over a broomstick. Ruthie then, in a wink, as her father finished his first tale and quickly began another, set the stage. She turned off the bright sunlight of the previous story and, in its place, painted the star-filled sky of the second. As she set the stage, she found herself, like before, walking with her father, albeit his teenage version, along a split-rail fence through tall, itchy grass. There were other boys about his age up under the trees. She could hear them laughing. Be quiet, her father hissed at the boys. There she is. Ruthie, following her father, ran to join the other boys sitting in the darkness at the edge of the forest. From where she was now, crouched down, she could see a pasture glowing with moonlight. Strung across it like a crooked string, the split rail fence she'd recently been standing beside with her father. Now watch, I've seen her do it, the teenage Eustace whispered to no one in particular. Don't move a muscle, he whispered again, this time with a tremor in his voice. Far down below in the field, nearing the fence, walking with the same stick Ruthie still knew her to tote in life, was Granny Beck. She was plodding along the trail Ruthie herself had walked hundreds of times, as it's the way her family always walked to church. 
Just before Granny Beck reached the fence, her father's eyes widened, and she saw his lips were trembling. Watch now. He again whispered to the dark forms that were his bosom buddies. Forms, if Ruthie could see them better, would most likely be younger, fresher versions of her friend's daddies. Look, Eustace at last spouted, down below in the moonlight, mere feet from the fence, Granny Beck was no longer there. But where she had been, a gangly brown calf with bold white spots reared up on its hind legs, then shimmied beneath the old wooden fence. When well on the other side of the fence, the calf disappeared behind some tall, dead corn stalks, and then, as if a trick of the moon or the stars, it was again Granny Beck's white hair that was visible through the breaks in the corpses of corn. All the boys screamed and ran up into the dark woods, leaving Ruthie alone in time, watching a woman she still knew, watching a witch. The wagon hit an exceptionally deep rut, jolting Ruthie from her father's flashback that she had so deliciously wrapped herself in. For the remainder of the ride up the mountain trail, Ruthie's father told of how someone by the name of Elihu Coward had upset Granny Beck one night by not allowing her to make a warlock of him. Ruthie didn't ask what a warlock was. Eustace also told of how afterward Elihu had been ridden by Granny Beck for the rest of his days. She didn't understand that either. He told of how Granny Beck had made the ghost of some killer follow her great-grandparents home from a hanging once. He talked of Granny Beck wearing a horseshoe burn after someone put a red-hot horseshoe in the milk she cursed. He talked of where Granny Beck went on new moon nights, a place called Judah Color Rock, to cast her most heinous spells. And whether Ruthie understood it all or not, she listened. And every tale, every greasy grin, every curse and every scream her father meticulously carved out was soon tattooed across her young soul. As their family's clattering wagon eased through the fast falling night, the darkness began playing tricks on Ruthie's eyes. Ruthie saw Granny Beck in every shadow, in every dark place, and the air smelled of roasting ham and apples. Just as the wagon turned into the dark barn at Ruthie's house, a fat black crow that seemed to sail from out of the barn's rafters tore into Ruthie's mother's hair, then, with an eerie call and slapping wings, flew off into the darkness of the deepening night and vanished. The bird could be heard calling fast and mockingly as it sailed away on the wind, leaving Mary, Ruthie's mother, with thin creaks of blood running from her torn scalp down over her eyes and across her parted lips. The next day, Ruthie's baby sister answered a knock at the door. It was Granny Beck. After tugging the small child away from the doorway, Mary stepped to the entrance with a light blue rag wrapped tightly around her head. Well, what happened to you, youngin? The old witch asked with a crooked smile. Terrified of Granny Beck, Mary told the old crone that she had fallen in the barn. Granny Beck made a strange sound within her throat and asked for what she'd come for. Mary, I'm plum out of sugar and flour. Could I get a poke full of both of them from you? The old witch inquired. Mary knew she could give the items to the old witch, but if she did, she would catch hell from Eustace when he got home. So Mary told Granny Beck that she had none to spare and politely excused herself and shut the door. That night, all of the flour and sugar in the house was soured. None of it was salvageable. Granny Beck was also known to borrow things. And once she did, the person whom she had borrowed from would grow very sick every time. She once asked to borrow a white dress from Ruthie's mother. When Mary refused and left the old woman behind the front door, she found her white dress, which had been laid across her bed, completely burned and turned to ashes. Nothing else was harmed. The dress fell apart immediately. Time passed, and Ruthie grew into a lovely young woman. She married a local man and moved into a small cabin down the mountain near the river. In Ruthie's new home by the river, she would see Granny Beck from time to time through the window. The old witch would be hunkered down on her stick at the edge of the woods, peering through locks of snow white, no longer keeping her hair tight and tied as she'd always done. It was winter when it happened. The neighbors ran across the frost-covered earth in the wee hours of morning to tell Ruthie and her husband Bill the news. Granny Beck's house had burned to the ground in the night. Ruthie and her husband Bill quickly dressed and raced toward Granny Beck's derelict cabin. As Ruthie and the others stood bundled from head to toe in the freezing wind watching the smoke rise, from the remains of Granny Beck's smoldering home, a crow began to call. Ruthie was the only one in the group to pay the bird any mind, 
She traced the treetops with her eyes, looking for the crow. She never saw it, but it continued to call. Today, all that's left of Granny Beck's cabin are some charred black chimney rocks, completely overtaken by nature. But that's not where her story ends. Well, Ruthie was herself an old woman. She was attending a church service one late evening in the fall. She overheard a young boy telling his mother in the back row of the church about an old witch he had just seen in the graveyard. The mother hushed the child, but Ruthie turned around curiously. The mother, the service had yet to begin and many of the townsfolks were socializing in the church. Ruthie gained the attention of the mother of the child and she sent the child up to where Ruthie was sitting. The child was shy, but Ruthie had kind eyes. She asked the little boy about the witch she had overheard him telling his mother about. The child, the child paused for a moment with his head hung low before he spoke. Then he timidly said, she was ugly and had a stick. I didn't hear her walk up. She had a little bag hanging around her neck too. He went on to say that he had been playing in the graveyard, trying to catch lightning bugs. When out of nowhere, the old woman had appeared. The child told Ruthie what the old woman had said and Ruthie just nodded in acceptance. He told her that the witch had said, you better get on down to that preacher man boy, because I just passed the devil on his way up here to get you. <laughs> Ruthie just smiled and told the child to go back to his mother. Throughout the years, there have been countless sightings of Granny Rebecca Hoxie Dakin by hikers and campers in the Moses Creek and Caney Fork areas of Jackson County. They all seem to describe her the same way, being wiry and toting a stick. Some have seen her from a distance and reported to authorities because they thought it strange that an old woman would be out walking so deep in the mountains. Some have even gone so far as to describe the smell that accompanied her, a smell of roasting ham and apples. Had the child seen the old witch Granny Beck? Had Granny Beck ever really died? Or had she ever really lived? Was she more demon than flesh? Does she still scale those mountain trails in search of unsuspecting children? Do Granny Beck and the devil slow dance together along the moon-dusted paths in the wee hours of morning? Maybe she's the lone crow that doesn't fly away with the others when you pass by. Maybe she's the murder of crows that splits the stillness of a late autumn day with wings in unison and a symphony of screeches. Maybe it's the hem of her skirt rustling in the leaves and the laurels and not the squirrels you assumed. Maybe what you were certain was campfire smoke. In reality, was the wisp of her pipe. And maybe what you cast off as a trick of the dying of day, a mirage, a mistake of the eye, really was Granny Beck, really was the Witch of Caney Fork. A tiny, easily overlooked stone stands tucked away in the Balsam Grove Baptist Church Cemetery in Jackson County, North Carolina. Upon the stone, Granny Beck's birth and death dates read 1831 to August of 1912, however, no one knows how accurate the stone or the dates are, as there is no formal record of her birth or her death. The ancient little rock has but recently been adorned with the minuscule silver name tag that states the dates and in quotation says Granny Beck. Most residents of the area laugh at the stone marker, for they know in their hearts Granny Beck's frail, wicked frame isn't there resting beneath cedars and tall pines, but rather trotting the canopy trails of the back of beyond, still easing along the clandestine back roads, still whistling and nodding to entities that only she can see, and as always, eagerly awaiting the fall of night, a time of stars and screech owls and mountain magic. Thank you so much. So we have the stories of um, witches and ghosts and strange beasts but all of the stories, all of the stories are rooted in factual people, um, real stories that have come to us. And we had so much fun writing it. It was a trial because we tried to make every story like a little mini novel, something that, that stood alone, that could be pulled out in isolation. Um, but also, as you heard in just two stories, if you read the entire book, you will have common denominator characters and uh, settings and some words and phrases through a several of the stories and we plan to do that through, through the next book as well so that it doesn't read like the average ghost story 
Though like the average ghost story, where people like to have a place that they can go, we try to do that at the end of most of the stories where like, the Balsam Grove Cemetery. So the person who wants to, oh, I want to go see this grave, they can go up there and they can find it, right? Um, maybe it's a roadside, a historical marker somewhere. So like the classic ghost stories, we do that, but we try to make them more lyrical, more literature than just the twice told tales. Do we have any questions about anything? Oh, I like questions. <laughs> he says we, but he does all the writing. <laughs> and he does have a degree in professional writing as well. He didn't mention that, but he does. But, um, well, yes. Uh, have you heard the stories of the Dillsboro vampires? I have. Dr. I have, and we tell, you tell that. And I also tell that um, sometimes on the Woodlawn tour, we have there's an above-ground crypt at the Woodlawn Cemetery, kind of Dracula-esque. And so we'll we'll stop there as a catalyst, you know, and we'll talk about you know how it looks, you know, and then we'll tell the story. Yes, absolutely. Anything else? Any time that you think you know a ghost story, you know a great legend, you know, let us know. Because not only does it make its way into our, after we research it, not only does it make its way into our tours, but it makes its way into the books. And this is what this, I probably should have led with this, all right? Our motto is preservation through presentation, all right? That is our motto from day one. If no one's ever written about Granny Beck before, this is it, all right? You can find where we got the pieces of information. You can go online if you Google her and you search, search, search. You'll find people saying, well, my great-grandmother said this. But it's not in a collection. It's not in a story. All right? The final surrender of the American Civil War, nobody has that on Franklin's Main Street. It's a marker over there. But so much of these things will be gone with people. All right? And will, would have been gone. And so it's a personal endeavor. It's a personal goal to get everything. So we take what? We take the John Paris books. Scour over the John Paris books. Anything that has been written before, Gary Carden, anything, we read, we read, we watch documentaries, we listen, so that we know everything that's out there, so we know what, what's new, what we can find. And so we just want to be a new addition to that. We want to hold on to it. We, we want there to be several versions of these, of these books so that um, children someday will know, you know, how this town was named, you know, you know so on and so forth. So. That's being, being locals, we realize people that we went to school with that were born and raised in Silva and Franklin, they often go to college and move away, and so and don't and never realize the history and the rich heritage in our towns. Um, and they so don't appreciate hoping, because they don't know they don't appreciate. I want people to appreciate to what we have. Yeah. So and stay. Yes. <laughs> have you? done anything on Deputy Green that was murdered at Balsam and it's still unsolved. Are we talking about the Balsam Mountain Inn deputy? The, 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 that deputy? Um, the reason I asked you said Green Hill. Uh -huh. My great grandparents built the Balsam Mountain Inn. Okay. Oh, and they are buried at Green Hill. And it's all tied together. I'm doing a history of Balsam. Well, but I'm know. not writing a ghost story. Okay. Well, <laughs> he worked I don't know if you looked at but I have school. the Balsam, Balsam Mountain Inn <laughs> right here. Now, I intentionally, I wanted to work at that old historic inn. So I now, made that sure. that ghost story that they tell, mm -hmm. there's no substance to that I'm aware of. <laughs> there's, there's not. And what I do whenever you, you whenever you read it. But it is haunted. We mention, we mention the lady. We mention, I mentioned the lawman. <laughs> Absolutely. Mention all those things as things that people, uh, they're the real history and things that people see, but by no means how I, how I tie the woman into it is at the actual end of the story I say, is it a brooch that fell beneath the floorboard? Is there a, a love letter that fell behind the wall, you know, that might make someone walk the halls? I don't, I will not make history up. I won't say, well, a woman died on room 205, that's why, no. We'll say people say things happen in 205, but when it comes to history, You'll get the lawman in there and the mention of the real, the depot and the things like this, right? But we try to stay really true to the history. Very, very true. Well, the, the other deputy that he was supposed to meet was waiting at the hotel when he was shot 
at the old school, which was where the cemetery is now. Baptist Church Cemetery, that's where the old school See, was. See, what you need to do is you need to um, send this material to me because I don't know, I know, uh, that's when I know the skeleton of. I don't know about the Baptist Cemetery, don't know things like this, so it's from, it's from people like you that then give me those, t those details that I can eventually. Well, there's you know. still controversy about who did it. Because the man that was arrested was then released. Did you by chance see the television show that came out, what, 10, 15 years ago? Mm -hmm. um, Weird Travels. I got to be on that because I was working at the, the um, Weird Travels from the Travel Channel. Did a wonderful television show on the Balsam Mountain Inn. And they oh, actually, no, oh, it was that. wonderful. And they, they, re, um, they recreated the, the lawmen and so on and so forth. And I just got to be, you know, I was telling some stories of things that happened. But they did a very good job. But anything, but I would love any of those pieces of information. Yes, yes. Is there a lot of uh, Webster courthouse stories? No. Yeah, I think no. that was the only thing that in, took place. In this book, that's the only. Um, we have we have the ghost of Daniel Webster. Um, that'll be in the next book. That's not in this, but that's a story that we tell. You know, the great 1913, and people you know, saying that they see the ghost of Daniel Webster from the time it was built, and then again in renovation in the 1990s. So she talks about that on the tour, but that will be in a, in a second volume. But other than um, Webster has, I was up at the Webster Cemetery not long ago. Um, you got the soldier who reportedly <laughs> saved, the, the plaque says, saved the life of Wade Hampton. You've got Wesley Enlow up there, um, possibly the brother of Abraham Lincoln, if you buy into the conspiracy of Abraham Enlow. So um, whether, they're, whether it's in this book or on a tour, it's on its way, right? We're doing it, you know, like. <laughs> there was also a Confederate soldier that was shot dead in Webster. Let's see, I don't know about that. I'll look that up. Thank you. And I don't know about that one. <laughs> we ought to visit the Genealogy Society more often. <laughs> <laughs> we can chat. Come see us. We can I've been, tell you I've been over here the, um, to the Genealogy Society once or twice. But um, you know, I'm so busy, you know. But I do. I do well, if you talk to my cousin Bill Crawford, and I have, mm -hmm. yes, at the coffee shop, you would have an, a, <laughs> Yeah, that's good on Friday. She's yes. always there. Um, you'd have an old Bill volumes. Uh, he knows all the old stories. He does. He does. The he brief, really the brief does. meeting that and I had. And it was with. one of his ancestors that was the Confederate soldier that was killed in Webster, and he can tell you more about that story than I can. Yeah. But I can tell you about the Box Mountain Inn. We do have 21 Confederate soldiers buried in the Webster Cemetery. I didn't know that. There's a bunch of them in Green Hill. Put it in I'd, I'd be interested yeah. to know the names of the um, of your ancestors who built the Box Mountain Inn, so that when we do the tour up there, we'll be able to go to their graves and say that, because we'll, that would be another place to tell the story of the inn at the, or at the, the grave of the right. people well, who we have it. a family plot. It's if not very far. Email me the names, comments. anything, that would be fantastic. Okay. And I hope also, I hope you, um, some people, we do have some people, um, very few, who take the tours and are disappointed that it's not like a haunted house. All right. They want the chainsaw. They want the ride around. And, and I tell them, you know, it's a very, it's rich history. And that's why when we go into the cemeteries and we do the tours in the cemeteries, um, we've, been, we've been really lucky that people understand we're celebrating lives. You know, there's nothing, we're, we're just preserving. We're going to the graves of the earth and we're talking about this. We're talking about the Balsam Mountain Inn. We're going over to the revolutionary soldier love we're talking about him we're talking about um, um, who's our who's our lawyer friend with my favorite book judge Felix Alley we'll go to judge Felix Alley's grave and talk about the great material in the lost the, the random thoughts and musings of a mountaineer oh my gosh so what we're doing is preservation through presentation and it's celebratory yes it's filled with witches and ghosts and gallows and hangings and things like this things that really did happen all right but it's it's rich history. But there have also been things captured on film and EVPs. Oh, absolutely. Um, so there is that part of it too absolutely. that people send back to us and we can't explain. 
at the Woodlawn Cemetery. At the Woodlawn Cemetery, we have the the man who created the the first ghost box, the first EVP ever captured. You see the the show Ghost Hunters and things like this, and they walk around capture. The first EVP ever captured on planet Earth was captured right here in this region. It was captured in Franklin. It was April of 1982. His name is George W. Meek. He's buried at the Woodlawn Cemetery. And you can go, and I tell my the guests on the tours, I say, go look him up, all right? Don't look at me and shake your head, go look him up, because you can, you'll can you find him getting his honorary doctorates from different universities. He died in Franklin in 1999, insisted on being buried at Woodlawn Cemetery because he said he believed that this area was the place on planet Earth where the veil between the living and the dead was the thinnest. And hence, the great ghost stories, the great images that people do capture on their on on film and send back to us fantastic material so it's a it's a we consider it the best of the best as said there's nothing hokey it's rich history we we demand we only we only demand the best uh we, we we will not put a story that we think you know or well let's take this little piece and then add a bunch to it all right so we're very careful with what we do anything else Thank you so much, Greg. Uh, thank, thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll be happy to sign your books. We have some more for sale over here. We have some refreshments. So just make yourselves at home. Thanks for